Over to quantitative data then. So much of the same kind of idea, we have the same kind of issue. We have all of this raw data, but instead of colors, maybe we have distance traveled to school in kilometers. So we have a data set that looks something like this. And okay, we have a whole bunch of distances here. They're in kilometers, but taking a look at this data set is not too visually appealing. It doesn't really give us a good idea as to what's going on. We want to find a way to make this more visually appealing so that reader can just look at it and have a pretty good idea as to where the bulk of students live away from the school and what kind of our average travel time or distance traveled might be. Well, how do we do this? In our last case, we had to create that frequency table from our qualitative data sets. And we just said, okay, how many times do we see red? And we count red up and we cross that off and say, okay, we had six reds. Well, we can't really do the same thing here. I mean, if we take a look at it, we do have a few duplicates. We have 10.1, we have 10.1. Um, any others? I mean, here we have 8.5, we have 8.5. But for the most part, these are unique, right? There's not a ton of overlap between all of these different values. So we can't just count it up in the same way. But what we do want to do is ultimately the same thing. We do want to create a bunch of groupings and throw all of our data into one or more. Well, I guess no. We'll throw all of our data into one of these bins. We have a few questions that come up then. Um, first question. How many bins should we have? Should we put all of these data points into two bins? Should we put all of these data points into 10 bins? Uh, the problem is, is that if you use too few bins, you lose a lot of the granular information available to you, right? A lot of that little bits of information, distinction between one value and another. However, if we did too many bins, well, all we would have is all of these small little bars, all of height one. And that wouldn't really give us much information either. So there's a trade-off between these two extremes. Two extremes of being, well, let's use two bins, or in the other extreme, what do we have here, 20 data points? We could use 20 bins. Either case would be a little bit ridiculous. So what we want to utilize in order to figure out how many bins ideally we should have, it's just a guideline, it's just a framework, and this is going to drive many people crazy, is our rule of two to the K. And this rule of two to the K, what it says is that we want a K such that N, our sample size, so sample size is less than or equal to two to the K. So, okay, first thing, let's figure out what this sample size is, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about what this K is. So N sample size, what do we have here? We have four, eight, 12, 16, 20. So let's just write that there. N is 20. We have a sample size of 20 observations. What we want is some value of K. So K is our number of bins or classes. That is how many bins we're going to use to drop these observations into. This is going to be our suggested number. And there's two ways to go about this. The first way, we could just guess and check, right? We could go, okay, two to the power of two, well, that's gonna be four. Two to the power of three, well, that's gonna be eight. Two to the power of four is 16. And two to the power of five is 32. Oh, there we go, 32 is greater than or equal to 20. So five would be our suggested number of bins. How many bins we would want to drop all these observations into. So that's how our rule of two to the K works. This works well if you have a very few number of observations, but every now and then you're gonna have a large amount of observations. In this case here, when you have a large number of observations, rather than doing guess and check, it's easy just to solve this algebraically. The other way to do this is to solve it with logarithms, and the way we can do that is we can say that the 
log of n is going to be less than or equal to k times the log of 2. Doing a little bit of quick algebra here, we can say that whatever value we get in the log of n all over the log of 2 is going to be less than or equal to k. We can go the log of 20 divided by the log of 2 gives us 4.322. So in this case here, 4.322 is the suggested number of bins such that we're saying, hey, k, our number of bins, is going to be bigger than or equal to this number. So what's our next whole number up from 4.322? Well, we would suggest a value of k equals 5, which, keep in mind, exactly what we got from the other side as well. So all of this, this was just to figure out how many bins, how many classes we're going to use to split up all of these data points. We still have a problem. We still have a question that remains. And that question that remains is, how wide are each of these bins? And the big thing we want is we want each of these bins to be identical widths. We want them to cover the same amount of values on the number line. We don't want to use a bin of two, a bin of two, a bin of five, a bin of four, and another bin of two. No, no, no. We want all of these five bins to be the same width along the number line. And so how do we get this recommendation for number of bins? Or sorry, not number of bins, bin width. Let's, uh, let's go take a look at this. I'm going to make some room, get rid of some of this work here. Big thing to keep in mind from this is that we had our number of bins as 5. So let's just go. And I'll write down over here that k number of bins was 5. So our bin width formula, this is the next formula that we'll need to utilize, is we're going to say that i, our bin width, is going to be greater than or equal to, so bigger than or the same as our maximum value in the data set minus our minimum value in the data set divided by, no, sorry, divided by k. So again, k being our number of bins. So in order to work this out, we need to go back to our data set and we need to find our maximum and our minimum number. So let's quickly go do that. Uh, what do I have here? 12.5, this is popping out as the biggest one I see. Um, let's just double check with that though. Ah, uh, here we go, 13.3. So let's write that. We have a max of 13.3 and we have a minimum value now, uh, what's our minimum value? 9.174.5. I think this is going to be our minimum value. I don't see anything smaller than that. Nah, that's, that's it. So 4.5 being our minimum value. So then to work out, well, we have max, we have min, we have our number of bins. That's everything we need over here. Let's work out our bin width. So, okay i is going to be greater than or equal to 13.3 minus 4.5 all over k. k was 5 bins. So what does that give us? 13.3 minus 4.5 divide that by 5 and we get 1.76. So okay. Here's my little caveat. Rarely, rarely, rarely are we ever going to use this value, right? To count up to bins of 1.76 would be a nightmare. What we're typically going to do is we're going to round this up because we're saying i is bigger than this value. So we're typically going to round this up to the next bin width that works well for us. Um, looking at this, right, we don't want to go too high. We want to keep it relatively close to this. 1.76, well, it seems pretty natural to me to count by twos. So I'm going to say 
that we use two for our bin width. So what do we have? We have five bins of width two. Okay, what are we gonna do next? Next, we're gonna go and we're gonna create our frequency table. Let's just write this in, i equals two. Gonna make some space here so that we can actually create a frequency table. Again, if I erase that too fast, that's the beauty of a video. You can pause, you can rewind, you can go back to write those formulas down or rewatch re a part. So in this case here, we're gonna create that frequency table, very similar to what we did with our qualitative data, right? We're gonna have across the top here, we're gonna have our classes or our bins, right? In the previous case, this was color. In this case, this is our distance to school. So here we can be a little bit more specific than just this generic classes. Let's go like this and let's go, this is our distance in kilometers. So great, we have that. What else do we have? Well, we can work out our frequency and we could also work out our relative frequency just like we did in our case of our qualitative variable. And we can create a frequency table just like we did before. So let's create our bins. Minimum value we said is 4.5. Typically speaking, you want your first bin to drop a little bit below your first observation, but not too crazy low, because otherwise you have kind of loss of information in there. And so in this case, I like working with whole numbers. I'm gonna say that my first bin is gonna be four up to six, right? So four up to, but not including six. So that would really be four to 5.9999999. Similarly, our next bin is gonna be six up to eight, right? I have a bin width of two. And again, this is up to, but not including eight. Eight up to 10, and then 10 up to 12. And what do I have? One, two, three, four, one more. 12 up to 14. So I have my five categories, each of width two, and such that up to, but not including 14. That is, each of these is mutually exclusive. There is no overlap. So quick question. Say we had an observation in here. Oh, we do, we do. Let's look at this. We have observation 10 here. Oh, we have, 10 showing up here, and we have 10 showing up there. If we were just to go name our bins, one, two, three, four, and five, which bin would we throw this observation into? Would we throw this into bin three or into bin four? Okay, hopefully in this case here, you answered bin four. Bin four is where this observation would go, because keep in mind what these bins are is 10 up to, but not including 12. So that's technically 10 to 11.99999, 8 to 9.99999. So whenever we have this, that's right on the fringe between two bins. Well, it's not in this one. It is in bin four, 10 up to 12. So little thing, common mistake that ends up happening though. So watch out for that. Okay, let's count our bins, let's put in our, sorry, count our frequencies and drop them into their respective bins. So let's take a look here. First one, we're looking at four to six. So let's cross them off as we go. Nothing in there, nothing in there. Nope, nope. Looks like I just have the one observation. So, okay, one. Next one, six up to eight. So 8.8, .8, but no, that's not gonna count. 
seven. Okay, so I have 7.9 and that's it. Okay, so just one in that category as well. Next one up, eight to eight up to 10. So, okay, that's gonna be that guy. One, two, three, four, five. Nope. Looks like I'm gonna have five in this case here. 10 to 12, no, but yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. That's gonna be our biggest frequency for sure. And our final one here, 10 to 14, hopefully, sorry, 12 up to 14. This is gonna be our remainder, one, two, and three. So final frequency of three. And then our final check, if we did all of this right, we should be able to, let's just draw our lines down a little bit here. Okay, we should be able to take the summation of all of these frequencies. And if we haven't missed anything, if we've done everything right, this summation should be one and the same as our sample size. So let's make sure. One and one is two and five makes seven. Uh, seven and three is 10. 10 and 10 is 20. So great. We've done this. We haven't messed this up. We can figure out the relative frequencies in just the same way, right? So to keep in mind what that means, Right now we are saying that out of our sample of 20 students, only one lived between four and six K from the school. Only one lived between six and eight, five between eight and 10. Most people live between 10 and 12, probably out in Langford, and three lived quite far away, 12 to 14. So the frequency of our sample in each case. To get the relative frequency, Let's just do this in a different color just for fun. This is gonna be the percentage that this bin is in relation to the total. So again, that's one out of 20. One out of 20, that's gonna give us 0 0.05. 0 0.05. What's that gonna be? Five out of 20, that's gonna be 0.25. 10 out of 20 will be 50% and three out of 20 will be 15%, 0 0.15. Again, we can add all of these up. We can sum them. If you were wondering what this little E is, this is the Greek letter sigma, capital sigma, which we use to notate a summation. And we have five plus five is 10, 25 gives us 35, 50 gives us 85, and then 15 gives us one or 100 percent so we have our relative frequencies as well as our actual frequencies and our frequency table so okay quite a few steps just to display this raw data in our frequency table let's let's quickly run through those step one step one was to determine number of bins Right, and our number of bins, that was using our rule of two to the K, such that N was just less than or equal to two to the K. Again, this is a suggestion. This is a rule of thumb. Depending on your situation, you may need to adjust this if it's not capturing it based off of how it should. Second point, after we determine our number of bins, we need to figure out our bin width. So bin width. And bin width, we used our bin width formula for that, such that I, the width of each bin, was going to be our maximum minus our minimum all over our number of bins suggested above. So number of bins, bin width, next thing to do is to create our frequency table.
So, okay, we'll create our frequency table, or if we're dealing, if we want to deal with relative frequencies, we could create a relative frequency table just as easily as our next step. Our fourth step, and what we're going to jump to next, our fourth step is to create a histogram. And so a histogram is very similar to the bar chart that we had already created. There's just going to be a few fundamental differences that we'll take a look at as we go ahead and graph this. Let's then take a look at how we create this histogram. Uh, the starting steps are virtually identical to what we did when we were creating the bar chart. So in creating this histogram, first thing we want to do is, of course, create our axes. So to create our axes, vertical to horizontal, label them, because if we don't label them, what do they mean? This is our x variable. That is, this is our distance in kilometers. And we have our height, which is the frequency. Again, we want to put some scale to this. So to put some scale to this, let's uh, start a little bit higher than we need. Let's say that that's 12, cut that in half. What, that's about there. Six, half again is three, half again is nine, and what, I can go one, two, four, five, uh, seven, eight, and 10, 11. Not perfect, I'm bunched up a little bit at the top, but again, going by hand, it is just a rough scale. Now for the bottom, when we're dealing with qualitative variables, we just kind of plop them down, right? We just picked a line and we said, boom, white, boom, blue. We're not gonna do that in this case here. In this case, we're dealing with a quantitative variable that has order, four is less than 14. And so we're gonna actually keep a scale as we go up. For our horizontal axes, this guy here, we notice that it starts at four. So what we can do is we can actually cheat a little bit and we can put in a little thing like that, meaning that we're gonna start this guy at four. So this whole zero to four range is jumped over right there. The scale is not necessarily gonna carry on forward. Imagine if you were, or this horizontal axis just got squished up and it buckled, right? That's what this little line is supposed to represent. Going from here, we're gonna do our best to jump up in terms of two. So we're gonna go four, uh, we'll say that is six. Maybe this is gonna be a bit wide. Eight, 10. Yeah, maybe that was a bit too wide. Let's make them a bit narrower. So four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14. So we have a bit of a scale here. Let's just finish that up. Six, eight, 10, 12, and finally there, 14. Keeping in mind all of these are kilometers or distance from the school. So, okay, now, our histogram, we're just gonna build this in much the same way as our histogram. We're just gonna have our heights. So our first box, four up to six, well, from four up to six, we're gonna have a height of one, right? There's one. Our next box, six up to eight, our next bin, well, six up to eight, we'll have that one there. That should be the same height I picked a little bit lower. That's just an artifact of freehanding. Next one there, eight up to 10. So eight up to 10. We're gonna go for a height of five. So what do we have? Three, four, five. That's gonna be somewhere up here. Let's see how well I can do that. Ah, maybe something like that. 10 up to 12, that is all the way up to 10. So from 10 all the way up to maybe something like that is our 10 point, I think. And our final one there, 12 up to 14, that is at three. And we have our final box. Let's see if I can do that one a bit better. 
There we go. Final box there. Ah, oh, straight lines are hard. There we go. And we have our histogram. Very similarly, we could color in these boxes in order to provide additional visual appeal. And what we have is we have our distribution of distances to the school by students. And what we can quickly see in this, most students live 10K or farther from the school. So the histogram allows for quick, easy access of the information. Some tips and tricks with it. So the first thing that we did is we truncated the horizontal axes. This is fine. We don't want to include a ton of white space that we're not counting, that we're not including. So truncating the horizontal axes is just fine. Same as when we were dealing with the bar chart though, you would not want to truncate the vertical axes. The vertical axes should always start at zero and continue upwards. If this is truncated, it can lead to very, very misleading data sets or data visualization rather. So okay to truncate the horizontal, do not truncate the vertical. Other things you'll notice is that our bars, they actually touch, they flow into each other in this case here. That is because our data for up to six, well, six then flows into the next one up to eight. It's not like we had it before, where it was white, blue, green, yellow, which didn't have a logical flow in between. In this case, this one flows right into the next one, into the next one, into the next one. So a better way to visualize our data altogether, and we see how it comes together. I'd recommend you practice building histograms by hand, practice using the rules and figuring out what does and what does not work. It is a lot of justification. It's a lot of what can be visually appealing in terms of our rule of two to the K and our bin width formula. There's a little bit of picking a suitable number in each case. If you have any questions about creating histograms, feel free, drop me a line, shoot me an email, post onto the D2L frequently asked questions, or feel free to drop in during the office hours. Next, we're going to take a look at how we can go and draw an OGIV or a cumulative frequency diagram from this.